Any other questions? Because I don't want to miss this. This is uh, the Malacca Strait. It still is a crucial choke point to ocean-going traffic uh, of global trade, uh, as is uh, the, the tip uh, below India, cutting across the Indian Ocean, um, up to the Red Sea and the Suez Canal. Uh, and it's remarkable what you can do with computers. And there's the Suez Canal. Look how important that is. Um, the thing, then this cho next choke point, the Straits of Gibraltar between Spain and Africa, um, right near Casablanca, where we were looking before. Now we're zooming in. We can track the name of every ship. We can see how fast they go. We can see what's their port of registry. We can see how many are in port and for how long. So uh, this is one of the big changes uh, that is occurring in history. Uh, the historical record is not this stable thing. It doesn't stay put. It keeps shifting. It keeps moving. And uh, so this is just our friend the Panama Canal. Uh, just a stunning demonstration of what is possible, um, the new things that are possible uh, in doing history. Um, and so we go from MIT, we shoot over past England, and we're going to make a visit to one of our favorite places in the world, Amsterdam. Great place. How many people have been to Amsterdam? How many people are from Amsterdam? Okay. So um, I wish Amsterdam, I could justify making Amsterdam more a central uh, part of this course. I suspect this is it for us of the 96 sites we visit. Um, here we are on the Damrock, uh, at the center of Amsterdam. And this building is a, a modest, unassuming building um, that starts out as the corn exchange uh, for several centuries, and uh, at the center of town, uh, and it takes on, it suddenly takes on a very important role. How many people have heard of the tulip mania? Tulip mania. We don't. We're not big on financial history. It's also abstract. But in tulip mania, one tulip bulb at one point was trading for the equivalent of twelve acres of land. You can either have 12 acres of land, which is huge, by the way, or one tulip bulb. And uh, the crazy thing, it wasn't just fancy pants Wall Street brokers who were cashing in and making millions overnight. It was the good people of uh, the United Provinces, um, the Romstad, the, the port cities of the Netherlands, the low-lying lands, um, famously pragmatic. Uh, out of necessity, when you are when you exist at or below sea level, and uh, you either perish, as happened in the ninth century, uh, as a as a entire society when the North Sea flooded, or you build dikes, and everyone builds a dike, and everyone is dependent on the strength and consistency of their neighbor's dike. All it takes is one person to neglect their dike, and the entire community floods. And so it is famously uh, the birthplace of a consensus collectivity uh, and pro pragmatic problem solving involving the built environment, like transforming the landscape to make sure that everybody's health and welfare is safeguarded. And so there's this polder mentality that uh, famously develops uh, over the history of the Netherlands. Um, and there's a pragmatism, some people would call it being cheap, but there's a pragmatism that goes along with this, that uh, it launches this whole new era uh, in the context. And, and this lecture is, in one way, it's about the British and the English and their home bases at Amsterdam and London. But another way, it's, a, it's another checking into this idea of the metropole, the capital city, uh, the sophisticated, wealthy uh, accumulation of power and wealth in Europe. So the two metropoles, 
are London and Amsterdam. And then there's two peripheries, two outposts out in the hinterland, the hinterland where the commodities and the source of wealth are accumulated, collected, and shipped off to the metropole, or the wealth that accumulates at the metropole is derived and extracted from the periphery. And sometimes it's a vast periphery, but it usually has to channel through points, crucial points of control. And so the real pairing is not Amsterdam and London, although they are quite a pair, as you'll see. It's the real pair is Amsterdam and its periphery control point, Satavia, now known as Jakarta. And the other pair is London and its colonial point of control, Calcutta. And the amazing thing about this, from our perspective, is we think, oh yeah, nation states do this. This was not an operation of the nation state. Uh, it's important to overcome our bias. We think of the, everything operating in terms of nation states. This was the operation of a company in both cases. And they had almost the identical names of the Dutch India or Dutch Indies, the Dutch East Indies, uh, the British East India Company. And this company was an innovation that was born here in the exchange and is embedded in the architecture of this building. And so we should be able to learn something about this transformation of human history, the shift from absolute monarchy, the power of the throne and the crown, shifting to uh, an accumulation of commercial interests. And what makes this possible is stock. Uh, the, um, the adventures of spice traders, and we will find out soon just how important spices were for several centuries. Question? Why were turtle bones so expensive? Why were they? Yeah. Because uh, exchange value. Your parents, uh, how many people grew up in a, in a house where, had, where there was, seemed to be some extra rooms that you don't really use? Yeah, so what are those rooms for? Uh, your parents would say, well, when we bought the house, we were concerned about resale value. And so that, uh, for those of us who have experienced this, it's a vivid, direct experience of uh, what Marx identified as these two sources of value, exchange value and use value. There are lots of rooms that we use, and we couldn't really function as a family without using these rooms, but then there are other rooms or other features of the house or other aspects that are there because we want to protect the resale value. And so the tulip mania, are tulips useful? Sure. They smell nice. They're aesthetically pleasing. We love tulips. We all love tulips. But the, va the use value of the tulip is like this, and it became uh, a focus of speculation that everyone was so crazy about how much money could be made from buying and selling tulip bulbs that everybody wanted them because their value kept going up and up and up. And our experience during our lifetime of 2008, the housing bubble, the exchange value of housing, way, way, way outpaced the use value. And we kept buying houses, and we would lend money to people who never could repay those mortgages because we knew they would sell their house eventually. They could always sell their house for a much higher value than they bought it for, so why not? Let's give lots of money, uh, get lots of lending, uh, based on the assured confidence that the value of houses in the United States will always go up. So the exchange value go way outpaces the actual use value. It creates a bubble. Tulip mania is the, the most famous bubble in human history because it was so extreme and it was one of the first mass delusions. Uh, it's famously written about in 1821 uh, by an English economic historian who made the tulip mania thing a famous episode in economic history. So I don't know if it's that does it raise more questions? So why did people choose tulip? Like that's completely useless. Well, um, <laughs> it's not completely useless. It could be, turns out, it could be anything. It could even be, as we saw in this class, uh, apartments 
at the top of the tallest building in the world in Dubai. I don't need to live there. No one lives in those. They bought them because they're going to retain their value and actually grow in value, or we think they will. So 10 years from now, they'll be worth twice or three times or four times what they were worth when I bought it. I don't need an apartment in the Burj Khalifa at all. It's just an investment. And it kept going up. So I would buy tulip bulbs because the value kept going up and I could become wealthy overnight or sell them a week from now and, and retire forever. Yeah. I like diamonds are a preference though. Can't you just go plant more tulips and they can yourself? You could. And it, it was difficult. It, and people did that to increase the value. But the mania aspect of this, people saw their neighbors getting filthy rich on tulip bulbs. And so they would plant tulip bulbs, and the, the demand was insatiable because of the desire to get wealthy. Not because we like the colors or the smell. It wasn't the use value, it was the exchange value that, that drove tulip mania, that drove the housing bubble in the United States, that is driving the incredible bubbles in China and the Middle East. That we've looked at. Okay. Um, so we had spices. Spices were extremely useful, unlike tulips. Spices before the age of refrigeration were the key to eating protein in the winter months. Uh, you, you needed pepper, you needed salt and pepper to preserve meats, cure meats, and keep them from rotting, to dry them out, keep them from rotting. Uh, so you, you could have protein over the long winters, and nutmeg and cloves, and these spices became so useful. It, this was use value because it was the key to maintaining a healthy diet throughout the winter for all of Europe. And so boatloads of nutmeg and cloves, as much as you could pack in there, it was worth more than its weight in gold because a little bit of pepper would go a long way. And so these ships kept showing up in the port of Venice, and we'll be talking about this, um, from these mysterious places. And for hundreds of years, some people claim it, it drove uh, the Crusades to a large extent. Uh, Europeans wanted to know where are these damn cloves and nutmeg and pepper, where are these spices all coming from? These Muslim traders keep showing up, but we can't find the source and because these Muslim traders are getting filthy rich. And every time it changes hands, the price goes up. We want some of that money. And so the Portuguese were the first ones to break the secrets. We'll talk about that in a few weeks after spring break. Uh, and then uh, the Dutch sent a spy. Cornelis de Houtman uh, was uh, infiltrated a spice mission from Lisbon and uh, discovered the source of the spices in the Spice Islands in the nation we now call Indonesia. And de Houtman was a Dutch spy, and he came back and he led a mission of four ships to the source of the spices. He got as far as the area around Jakarta, uh, then called Batam, uh, and uh, the Sundanese people. And it was a diplomatic disaster, and half the people died. Uh, they came back empty-handed. And the financiers of this whole spy, this corporate espionage mission, were ruined. Uh, and, and yet, a few years later, in, in uh, 1599, another mission went out, and they quadrupled their investment. And so one mission went out, it was a total failure. The next mission went out, quadrupled its, its, uh, its value. But no one wanted to finance these trips, because the success rate was so risky. So the invention of the joint stock company made all the difference. By selling shares in a company that would mount several of these ventures, you could, could take that probability. Instead of it being a roll of the dice, you either cash in 400% on your investment or zero. You, If it's a 50-50 prospect, then you get 
uh, 200%. So if you even out the odds, you're going to double your value even if half the missions are total failures based on the small sample size. And so all of a sudden, these reluctant venture capitalists who couldn't justify taking this huge risk of investing in a mission to the Spice Islands, all of a sudden they could. And these crazy people who were buying tulip bulbs, these same people who had some money to spend, could actually invest in a more secure way in the Dutch East Indies Company uh, on their ventures to the Spice Islands. So all of a sudden you had this huge thing driving uh, activity, commercial activity in these uh, transoceanic ventures. And it manifested in the city of Amsterdam, which is a port city of canals. Uh, these goods would come in. It's a militarily protected uh, bay. And the boats would come in on the Amstel River to the dam. And you see that little U-shaped thing. Let's blow it up and see, see what we got. Did we do this? Is it high enough resolution? So see that little U-shaped thing? That's the exchange building. And it looks like this uh, at the moment when the Dutch East India Company uh, is put into being. And it's handily uh, open to the street. You can see the form of these classical columns. If it were higher resolution, we'd see that the, these gentlemen are dressed properly. There was a, a code of behavior that was strictly enforced in the exchange building. Uh, you would stand by this column or that column, depending on what commodities you were interested in trading. And you weren't allowed to spit. You weren't allowed to swear. And you, there was a certain code of decorum of your dress, which uh, figures heavily into this lecture. And um, as the company developed, and here's another view. Let's see, can we? And the building changes, but its location is crucial. It's at the center of governance on uh, Dom Square, where the, the Stott House and the VAG, which is the place where the units of measure and weight are all standardized, uh, which is another key factor of trade, that you don't want one person's pound to be greater or less than someone else's pound. Uh, and the exchange building over the river itself. So the key thing in the architecture, um, and we're missing my fear of losing the order. Um, this is the Dutch East India Company headquarters in Amsterdam uh, in multiple views to the present day. This is the one. So when the, when the, the stock exchange building is updated in the next century, uh, it takes on this aspect of um, you can't quite see it, but you can go down and uh, check the, uh, the goods on the boat. So you have pieces of paper that represent the commodities. And then you go down and you inspect in, uh, the actual commodities, the physical commodities themselves. And so that establishes the accountability that there actually are uh, 781 bushels of corn or whatever the commodity is. And so it's this architectural mechanism of establishing trust at the center of Amsterdam that reinforces uh, the trust that is at the core of all of these interactions right to the present day. That trust is the crucial thing. I give you a dollar bill, you're trusting not so much in God as it's stamped on it, but you're trusting that uh, the federal um, bank and the International Monetary Fund is going to maintain the dollar as this stable, dependable uh, thing, and you're going to get a dollars of value in exchange. And so we see this, um, uh, this construction of Amsterdam as a mechanism uh, for supporting this trade. And Amsterdam takes over from the Mediterranean uh, capitals of finance and trade from Venice. that moves to Genoa. And from Genoa, it moves to Antwerp. And from Antwerp, it finally conclusively resides in Amsterdam, where uh, it becomes uh, a very strong capital and the explosion of population, because people come from all over the world to engage in this trade. Uh, and the expansion of Amsterdam um, which is this fractal geometry where uh, it goes from the exchange building to the 
shop houses along the canals. And the commodities come off the boat onto the street and from the street into the shop house. Uh, so it's the classic entrepot trade that we saw in Shanghai. Um, here's the next version of the center of Amsterdam where you see the exchange building, the, the weights and measure building, the, the, uh, the town hall, which then becomes the royal palace, and the cathedral. Um, and there it is in, in the painting. There's the royal palace, the, the Vague, uh, the You can almost see the, the river, the Amstel, and the exchange mechanisms, and then you see the houses of the merchants. And Amsterdam, uh, because of its cultural tradition, is not big for opulent palaces like we saw in St. Petersburg and in Rome. It's a much more subdued, uh, take care of business kind of approach, uh, especially during uh, its uh, foreign rule by the Spaniards. Uh, it gets a little bit more exuberant, and we see that on the Herrenkrat, which is the gentleman's canal uh, that built that grows uh, to accommodate. This is the exception. These are not shop houses. These are the shop houses of wealthy merchants, and so there's this accumulation of wealth amongst those who are trading in the shares, and the the crown is less of a factor. Uh, it's more a uh, a parliamentary system, and we'll see this in London as well. And here's uh, Hamburg, uh, a, a German port. Uh, but this painting, it's very rare. People didn't really pay attention to the infrastructures of trade. But you see the ship, uh, the warehouse or factory, and the crane for lifting things. So the logistics of ocean-going travel requires certain characteristics. You need to uh, put the shop house factory very close to where the boat can get. Because of the physics of water, and we've talked about this previously, it is by far the cheapest way to travel, uh, to send heavy things. And getting the boat into your factory, or as close as possible, offers huge advantages. And there is a West Indies company uh, with its uh, warehouses and port facilities. Uh, and here we see the actual geometry when we see things like the nation state and we see colored shapes uh, that are coloring in the entire country, uh, this is what we really mean. This is the actual formal spatial arrangement of the extraction of wealth here in Suriname, which is part of uh, South, Af South America. These are the actual land parcels, the plantations from which uh, commodity extraction occurs. And the crucial element is the access to the river. And so the mapping of the world uh, reflects this. And so we, we see every river inlet along a coastline identified and labeled. And the geometry, uh, so those are the points. Um, and one of the big themes of the whole course is that uh, instead of thinking of the world as these big shapes of nation states, we should be thinking of these points of engagement. And Amsterdam um, is one point of engagement. And these are the lines that connect Amsterdam with all the ports. And this is another new uh, thing. We have ship's logs uh, from this period of ocean-going trade. Uh, these ships are still uh, being driven by the wind. And that's why you see these very distinct patterns because of the wind patterns. They are following the advantages, the advantages of global wind patterns and following uh, the easiest path. Sometimes the quickest way to get from point A to point B is to go with the wind in the wrong direction and then cut across the Indian Ocean. And so this is the actual location uh, of these things. Here's the shipyard uh, where the boats are produced. Uh, remember our friend Peter the Great, who went on the great em the grand embassy tour of Europe, especially spending four months in Amsterdam. This is where he was visiting. Uh, he was obsessed with uh, the naval production uh, that was the basis of Dutch wealth and uh, power. Here's a more abstracted um, set of lines in 1840 
there was this fierce competition as the Spaniards and the Portuguese still dominated much of uh, the global trade, as we'll look at after spring break. Uh, but then the, based on the power, the financial power of the British and the Dutch, uh, financial, the, the stock exchange and the joint stock company, the financial mechanism, all of a sudden, these state-run trading operations of the Spanish and the Portuguese, based on the extraction of gold and silver, especially from the Americas, starts to lose ground to the emerging explosion of Dutch and English activity. And the Dutch are pushing out uh, the Portuguese as they are, are waning. And the Dutch and the English are increasingly competing. Um, and the logistics of moving things on and off boats, which gives rise to the cargo container, these container port cranes, uh, the ships stacked with these standardized containers, and then eventually the uh, emergence of the super ship, the, the Panama Max, uh, the, the, and the reason why the Panama Canal is expanding at great expense, uh, is to increase the economies of scale of ocean-going travel. It's not enough that you can move things for 83 cents uh, per ton. It needs to be brought down to 73 cents per ton. And there's enough savings there to justify all kinds of wacky investment, including this ship where you drive things on and off. Um, so you don't need the big uh, contain, uh, cranes. So here's the earlier version of this along the canal. And so unlike the Herrenkracht, uh, the gentleman's canal with the fancy houses, this is a working landscape where the canal, this fractal geometry, and I can say that with you guys, right? It's, it's a matter of maximizing the surface area where the water meets the fabric of the city. And the more linear feet you can get, the more wealth you can extract from the whole machine. And so these capillaries of canals uh, find their way inland and the boats can be directly offloaded onto the street and from the street into the shop house and then back again, either after adding value through production or some other way. And so we see an explosion in population. Um, and here we see, not far from the original location of the stock exchange, we see Hendrik Petrus Berlachen's uh, famous stock exchange building from 1898. I'm just Throwing this in because Berlacha keeps showing up in Java and other parts of our story. His, um, his emulation, uh, his, the influence that Frank Lloyd Wright has on him has already um, made an appearance. Um, so are there any questions? That's Amsterdam. Yeah. Why didn't England or Netherlands try to Oh, they did. Um, but they didn't need to so much. They, they found it, it's so expensive to go to war. We're men of business. Uh, and especially the Dutch. They had no problems selling things to the Spanish, even when the Dutch and the Spanish were at war with each other. This is, you know, hey, business is business. No hard feelings. And so the rules of commerce and the advantage of, of working past these petty disagreements uh, ruled the day. It's like the McDonald's theory of global geopolitics. Up until a moment, uh, no, uh, in, I think it was in the 90s, up until that point, no two countries that both had a McDonald's restaurant had ever gone to war with each other. You know, and that was the, that, that's long gone, I think. So uh, any other questions about Amsterdam? So here we are, zooming across the planet, and we're going to check out this place. Um, here's the Straits of Malacca, right there. The choke point, the Portuguese controlled everything with the trade because they controlled Malacca. Well, Malacca, Shmalacca, the judge said, and they cut across the Indian Ocean. They didn't go through the Straits of Malacca. They went through here, and they established uh, trading relationships, uh, as did the the English at the same time, but hold on to the table so I don't fall over as we zoom in. Uh, and they were competing, and they actually fought a war for control of this port. Uh, and in 1619, the Dutch 
uh, blew away the British and burned the Sundanese uh, fishing port, trading port, to the ground. Absolutely flattened it and established Batavia. Uh, and we're going to be looking at the sugar factory. And so everything we saw on the Amsterdam side repeats on the East Indies side, on the island of Java. And so here we see the sugar house, uh, where the sugar is grown in plantations uh, outside of Batavia, but also throughout uh, the island network, close, where ports are, are accessible. The spices from the Spice Islands, um, the Molokas, uh, are brought here as well. And so this becomes the key military headquarters of Dutch trade. And when I say Dutch trade, I don't mean the government of the Netherlands. I mean the Dutch East Indies Company. And this is one of the characteristics of the companies, the English and Dutch companies, is they start out as um, these investment uh, arms, but they need to protect their investments, so they hire some mercenaries. And then they need to establish the military basis for those mercenaries to operate uh, because they're not just negotiating trade. They want a monopoly. Does that ring a bell? It's not totally different from uh, what the reason why your cell phone, <coughs> monthly cell phone charges are so much higher than every other place in the world. Um, monopolies are great if you are the monopoly and you're the ones who can take advantage of the control. And the Dutch didn't want to just trade. They wanted to trade with uh, sole trading rights with access to the spices. So much so that when they found out one of the uh, 100 or so villagers who occupied the island that was the only source of nutmeg in the world, or was it cloves, when, when the British got a hold of some cloves from this island, they did what any reasonable European uh, money-hungry colonial company would do, is they killed everyone on the island. And they replaced the population with indentured servants slash slaves to make sure this never happened again. Um, that's how important the monopoly was. Here are the Spice Islands. Uh, Ternat. And uh, these, these was, the, was the only place that cloves and nutmeg came from. And so in 1619, they, um, they take the ashes, they push away the ashes from the burned down city of Jayakarta, and they establish Batavia, and they say, we're going to make it like Amsterdam. And so they very consciously emulate, they, they basically copy what happens in Amsterdam, and they replicate it here with the fractal geometry of maximizing the linear juxtaposition of shop houses and canals. Uh, and they fortify it. They surround it. They put a fortress at the mouth of the river to control access. And um, this is over a very short period of time from the moment when they uh, burned down Jayakarta very quickly over the course of a few dozen years. Uh, establish um, a Dutch uh, fortress, port, canal, town. And I string those terms together because it's not just a fortress, it's not just a town, it's not just a canal town. Uh, it's this, this series of crucial functions that manifest physically. Uh, it is a fortified port canal town. And here's the, the fortifications based on medieval practices uh, to protect it mainly against British competition at that time. And then they establish uh, a civic center because one of the crucial elements is how do you get Europeans to show up and run this machine? And so they have to create a certain civilized presence. They have to create... Um, the series of docks that control the mouth of the port, and this is how they do that. Uh, this is a technology that is repeated all over the world, wherever the port town system, and we'll see this same system, uh, this infrastructure in the Americas with the Spanish and Portuguese. 
um, the, the high tide, low tide to maintain the depth so that uh, the ships uh, can come in and out. And so all of this infrastructure is fundamentally uh, linked up with the architecture of the ships themselves. The technology uh, advancements uh, that the that Peter the Great was interested in with the production of the Indiamen uh, class of ships. Here we see an Indiamen class of ship that the Dutch were building uh, at work. Uh, it's part of a synchronized architectural system uh, with two ends, uh, one in Amsterdam, one in Batavia, and the architecture of the ship running between the two. And so here we see it develop further. And every neighborhood has its own identity and its own class of resident. And I say resident, not citizen. Um, we'll get to that. And so here we see the growth of the town. Totally fictitious landscape. This is not based on eye, uh, eyewitness account. This is written accounts are then translated into illustrations. Um, and so the, the design of the ship is a crucial part of this. Uh, here's we see an Indiaman uh, that we saw previously. And this is how it worked. Um, you would have to fill it with enough to sustain a small crew, but also uh, you need a payload. And uh, spices uh, tend to be hugely valuable and take up very little space. But then there was sugar, tobacco, uh, and a whole list of commodities that evolve over the years. And so now we see the building out of the city of Batavia. The civic center here with the Stott House and the church. Uh, but it was very difficult to convince uh, Dutch uh, soldiers or officials to relocate here because of the malaria, the disease, the very high death toll. Um, and they especially could not convince the wives of the Dutch officers to relocate here. And so um, there was a, a vast system of concubinage, uh, if that's a word, and then in a mixed race population of what were referred to as Indos. And so the population uh, controls of this fortress town uh, is something I just want to finish with uh, because of time. The, uh, each neighborhood was identified uh, as the location of different people, and these people would actually be listed on these maps, and here are the, uh, the structures of these blocks. Uh, but you see down here, um, if it's uh, high enough resolution, you can actually uh, get a sense of what these neighborhoods were like, and some were more capacious than others, uh, because some were for Dutch, and some were for other populations in small groups. The interesting thing as you study this material is that the Sundanese and the Javanese were not allowed to spend the night in the town. This was to prevent uh, or discourage rebellion from within the city itself. So just like in Ternate, where they uh, eliminated the local population, they restricted uh, native indigenous peoples to live beyond the city walls, and they only allowed uh, populations in small groups from other parts of the vast global network. So there was a block uh, for the several dozen Suriname uh, people. The Madaris were, were convertible to Christianity. They didn't mind, and they, so they uh, would uh, be excellent soldiers in this part of the city. And, uh, and so it was um, the operation of this uh, system was not just to fortify and protect the access to the sugar house um, uh, along the canals, but also within the neighborhoods uh, and high populations of Chinese merchants, uh, but also indistinct cultural social groups uh, divided by language uh, so that no one group would represent a large threat. And this was the same uh, strategy we saw in Cape Town uh, in the development that grew into the Grand Apartheid system. Uh, you, see, um, you see populations accumulating in Batavia from throughout the, uh, the network. 
of the Dutch uh, East India Company trade. Uh, and you see the gallows over here. where enforcement of the rules uh, throughout these neighborhoods um, was reinforced by occasional hangings uh, of people who broke the rules. Uh, there was a, a governor general who got a fancy house, but in typical Dutch restraint, this is as fancy as it gets. Uh, remember this and compare it to what the English do in Calcutta. Uh, so it's a very uh, modest home by colonial standards. Uh, but this is the key point um, to end with, is that each doorway was uh, subjected to this Baroque extravagance uh, that signaled, it performed the task of signaling the status of those who were allowed to pass through that threshold. And so the structure of the, the mansion was a, a spatial uh, arrangement a formal spatial arrangement that reinforced behavioral norms and the rules of the household about who could occupy what space were strictly enforced based on this operation of symbolic system. The same thing occurred within the city of Batavia. In South Africa we saw that you had to carry a passbook and it identified your race and your permissions. Well this was a much more efficient system because Instead of a passbook that you had to pull out of your pocket and open up, uh, there were sumptuary codes that strictly uh, limited who could wear what kind of clothing. And so uh, because this Margaiker uh, from Madura uh, converted to Christianity, he was allowed to wear shoes. And if he raised to a certain rank or if he was of a, of a different ethnic mix, he would be allowed to have one or two buttons. And if he was even higher in rank, those buttons didn't have to be made out of pewter. They could be made out of other metals. And so every detail of the clothing is documented. And so these maps and these illustrations were the instruments of administering these passcode-like laws in colonial Batavia. And so it was an apartheid system that operated not through checkpoints and passbooks, but through enclosed urban forms and the clothing that people wore. And uh, here's the Hodramaut Said uh, visiting the merchant um, from the Middle East. It also uh, involved who was allowed to travel in what manner. Uh, Europeans could have horses and horse-drawn carriages. Uh, a, well-placed Chinese merchant couldn't have a horse or horse-drawn carriage, but he could be carried in a palanquin. Uh, but these things were strictly demarcated uh, to the point of some people could wear shoes, other people could not. And uh, these systems don't always uh, work flawlessly or prove to be sufficient. And we have the Chinese massacre in 1740, which have continued to occur through to the present age. Uh, we see um, Chinese massacres occurring with regular frequency throughout the history of this part of the world because of the jealousies uh, that accumulate of their relative wealth. Okay, questions about Batavia? Yes? Um, I hope it's not too long to answer, but uh, maybe you can Thank you for asking. I was skipping this, but that's exactly what happened. Um, so, yeah. I'm wondering if it wasn't actually a change based on sort of the moral identity of, of Europeans decided that they weren't going to support that, or were there, was there monetary restrictions? Exactly. It was uh, the, the system of cultural, of the, the cultivation system, the cultural stel cell, uh, the cultivation system where every Every plantation, uh, every part of the colonial empire uh, under the Dutch East Indies Company was required to produce X amount of sugar, X amount of tobacco. And if you don't you know, have enough time or land to produce rice, that's your problem. Well, it turned out to be their problem. 
that manifested in mass starvation in the late 19th century. And the, I told you about uh, Edward uh, Dowers Decker, who, under the pen name Motatuli, which means one who suffers, wrote a novel called Max Havala about the experience of a Dutch colonial officer witnessing mass starvation under the Dutch cultivation system. And this book, uh, which is not that well written, actually, um, just was a huge, it went viral, and it uh, was, I mentioned it before, the New York Times credited it with being the most important book of the second millennium, because uh, they said it was the book that ended colonialism. Judge for yourself. But it was, uh, it, was, it was popular opinion in the Netherlands that suddenly became aware, and that resulted in the, the shutting down of the Dutch East Indies Company, the Dutch government taking over, and the institution of the ethical policy, which manifested in the Bandung Institute of Technology thing that we looked at. So thank you for asking, for sake of continuity. Um, so here we, any, anything else? We don't have to do Calcutta, right? It's the, or we can, we're going back all the way to London again, um, spending way too much time in London these days. Um, that'll stop uh, with this. Um, and so the, the, the English actually uh, beat the Dutch as the first uh, Indies company. Uh, the British East India Company was established in 1600. Uh, and they operate uh, along similar uh, strategies in the Americas. Here we are. Um, sorry, we're not going to dig into um, the roots of the United States so much in this course, uh, because there are bigger fish to fry. My, my. And so we, uh, they do operate very aggressively. They were late to the game in the Americas. The Spani Spaniards and the Portuguese uh, get all the great American colonies uh, in North and South America, and their subtle little activities in North America are, are have to give way to what we're going to look at uh, in a few weeks of the Spaniards and the Portuguese. So, but we do want to focus on their grand colony of British India. And so, but we're going to start with what's happening in the metropole, in the center. And to do that, we look at St. Paul's Cathedral uh, by Sir Christopher Wren. Um, it starts with, our story should begin uh, with the Great Fire of London in 1666. And at this moment, there is a plague uh, that's killing lots of people. They're working on uh, solutions to that. We, sh we looked at John Snow's cholera map, uh, where there was the discovery that these diseases are waterborne, not through miasmas of smell. Uh, Sir Christopher Wren, before the fire, is already working on renovating Old St. Paul's at the center of London, uh, fixing the tower, and you can see uh, here uh, this panorama over the River Thames, uh, the beginning of Christopher's, Christopher Wren's uh, new tower on Old St. Paul's, uh, which unfortunately burns in the fire of 1666. And at that moment, you'll recall, there's all kinds of ideas around the world. We saw it in Rome, we saw it in St. Petersburg, and then later in Paris. These ideas of proper urban form according to the ordering principles of the Renaissance um, that we'll look at in future weeks. And here we have uh, Robert Hooke's. You know Robert Hooke. I'm assuming everybody took physics. Hooke's Law. It's the same guy. He is an amazing person, um, but we have no time to talk about that. So within a few days, even before the flames are extinguished, we have three plans for the rebuilding of London. Uh, this one, uh, and the star of the show, uh, Christopher Wren, proposes this, um, with grand plans according to the principles that looks a lot like the Piazza del Popolo in, in Rome. Uh, and so there's influence from Renaissance ideas and before. Um, and he's put in charge of the rebuilding of the city of London. And unfortunately, to his great disappointment, uh, 
it's really hard to change the pattern of streets in a city. Even when it burns down, there's still so much infrastructure embedded in the ground that these urban patterns, as we'll see uh, with the imprint that Rome leaves, uh, is still legible in cities throughout the Mediterranean world, including here, uh, that these old infrastructure patterns really don't want to be changed. And so London goes back more or less the way it was uh, to Wren's great frustration, but they hand him the commission for the rebuilding of St. Paul's. And a few of the things that happens with the building of St. Paul's is this whole debate that we keep talking about between the Gothic and its values and neoclassicism and its values. Uh, this is one of the hot moments in British uh, architectural debates between the Gothic and the neoclassical. And the neoclassical, in the hands of Wren, triumphs. Um, he proposes this modern neoclassical structure. The only compromise is he allows um, certain things to occur in the interior uh, that reflects a more Gothic approach. Structurally, it is still uh, Gothic because there are buttresses inside here, but he conceals them in this neoclassical skin of this blind second story. Uh, he puts on this dome. Uh, this is after uh, St. Peter's and Michelangelo's dome. Uh, it is ridiculously large. Uh, and even today, it just seems so oversized. Uh, but it is uh, this triumphant expression of uh, uh, English confidence and English superiority uh, that really is the justification, and this is the theme of this episode, the justification of British triumphalism. Um, they were as full of themselves as perhaps some would say the United States is now. And you see all of these elements from Bramante's work in Rome uh, just pumped up to gigantic proportions uh, in this system. Uh, and it dominates for centuries up to the present, um, the presence uh, that is celebrated throughout this history, uh, this British moment. Uh, and so St. Paul symbolically uh, exemplifies this power of the British. And you see more emulations of what uh, Wren found in his grand tour of Italy and Paris, uh, the doubled columns on the facade, uh, more appropriate to a palace, perhaps, than to a church. Uh, but this, again, this triumphalism, um, this exuberance. And uh, the, the Gothic component are these low side aisles that uh, the church was insisting on. Uh, but the dome is really uh, the main attraction of this remarkable uh, place. The Baldacchino, again, we recognize this uh, strategy as being a reproduction with difference as an architectural strategy. Uh, that was number two on our list of architectural strategies uh, since the beginning of the course. There is an awful lot of reproduction with difference going on uh, in St. Paul's. And that brings us quickly to the dome uh, and back to Robert Hook uh, in the physics of the moment. There are three distinct curves on this, which is what I love about this section, is you see three very different curves uh, in this dome. Um, which one is the sensible structural form? Given that this is a compression, this is not steel, you see the outer curve that, again, matches uh, the Cathedral of Florence. You see the, the, the middle one, which is a cone, almost triangular, and then the bottom one, which is a slightly different shape than the outer curve. Do you recognize these shapes? Which one do you think, how many people think the outer curve at the top is the one that makes sense structurally? How many people think the middle one is the one that makes sense structurally? I think there's nothing above. How many people think the bottom curves the one that makes sense? Oh, okay. So why is that bottom? You're right. Why is that one? You recognize that curve? Have you studied this on map? What's the name of that curve? It's a subclass of parabola. Catenary. 
So it's a catenary curve. If you hang a chain, uh, it takes on a shape because of the weight of each link of the chain. And that turns, about, turns out to be the perfect shape for handling pure compression. And so this is the shape uh, that makes sense. The triangular one is prone to failure in tension forces at, at the middle, and the top one uh, is really just a decorative shape. It, it's, you can see the trusses that are really holding up that outer curve. Um, but this is, again, Robert Hooke and his um, brilliance. Now, the interesting, other interesting thing about this, and one of the themes of the course, is the use of optical illusion. We saw it in Bramante. Uh, we saw it uh, in uh, multiple places, the Campidoglio, this use of forced perspective. Well, here, Ren is doing it in the dome. He wants us to believe that the, the shape we see from the inside is the same as this enormous, gigantic shape we see in the outside. And so he, he tilts the walls inward. Do you see that? He tilts the walls inward and gives us a forced perspective view when we look up into the dome. And it actually looks much taller than it really is shown in section. And so uh, it was actually a source of great anxiety uh, in London uh, because of how excessive it was. It's so large. Uh, it, and there was this whole tension, you'll remember, from uh, Martin Luther's 95 theses uh, nailed to the wall, uh, the door of the Wittenberg uh, cathedral and the birth of the Protestant Reformation, uh, challenging the doctrines of the Catholic Church and the Pope in Rome. And uh, England was very proudly non Catholic and it fought wars with the Spaniards to maintain its independence from the Holy Roman Empire, uh, famously in the Spanish Armada about 100 years earlier, and um, at multiple times since including the one that I'm going to mention is the, what's called the Glorious Revolution uh, of uh, 1688 because it involves the Dutch. The Dutch were the first to uh, counteract the Spaniards uh, and defeat them uh, in a long war won by William of Orange. Uh, finally, in uh, 1648, where a lot of stuff happened in 1648, and uh, England, at this moment, w during the construction of St. Paul's, finds itself in this awkward position of a king, King James, uh, coming down from Scotland, who was Catholic. And he was saying, you know what? We should tolerate Catholicism. We should let people worship as Catholics. And uh, the next in line for the throne was Mary, was to be Queen Mary. She was a Protestant. And uh, there was this holding of breath while King James uh, lived out his reign. He was old, but suddenly his young wife was supposedly pregnant. But there were rumors all over that she wasn't really pregnant. She was faking it. And when the baby was born, these rumors were so held such currency that uh, the parliament and the Whigs and the Tories got together and they said, hey, William of Orange, husband to Protestant Mary, William of Orange over there in the Netherlands, the Dutch. Uh, can, can you come over and, and invade the country? And that's what he did in, in uh, 1688. Uh, he mounted, let's see if I have a slide that goes with this. There's the Spanish Armada. So in 1688, uh, William of Orange uh, leads a fleet twice the size of the Spanish Armada slips into London. Um, the Royal Guard is invited to decamp to the suburbs, and uh, the king is in his nightgown, and he looks out the window, and there's all these soldiers wearing the blue and the orange of the elite guard of William of Orange, uh, who have basically invaded London and taken over. And William and Mary become joint monarchs, and because of this weak position, uh, of this invasion from the Netherlands, they have to negotiate a relationship with the British Parliament that dramatically reduces the power of the throne. And Parliament, there can be no taxes uh, levied without the approval of Parliament. And so you suddenly have this devolution of power that, uh, out of necessity to make a long story short, suddenly 
with this distribution of power, there is more power held locally, and so uh, there is more room, there's more wiggle room and less authoritarian power from the top down, so that people's rights, especially the right to free speech, starts to gain strength and flourish uh, in the period after what is now referred to as the Glorious Revolution and the rights of the people of England. And it is seen as the crucial social ingredient that gives the space and the opportunity for the Industrial Revolution. And as we go back in, in our course, uh, we will see multiple moments in history when there could have, should have been something like an Industrial Revolution in China in Egypt, all over the place, but people were afraid of the big social changes and especially their hold on power, and so they squashed technological innovation. Under the conditions of this new parliamentary de devolution of power, you see this flourishing and finally the conditions of the Industrial Revolution are there. Uh, quickly looking at how the, the aristocratic estates of uh, London are converted into residential squares, this new fabric. Um, maybe I'll give as a homework assignment, watch Downton Abbey. Uh, you see it happening in the 19th century, I mean in the 20th century in Downton Abbey. Um, but you see uh, the, Gro the Grosner estate becomes Grosner Square uh, and the residential quarters. And so you still see the imprint of this transformation. Uh, it starts with the laws of enclosure that we've been talking about in England. Uh, but then it progresses into this urbanization, and then this suburbanization, uh, which leads to the rise of the Garden City, um, these, these residential quarters, this rise in middle class with greater uh, freedom of speech, greater freedom of movement, greater freedom of risk-taking behavior, of innovation, of businesses, of the growing middle class, and the increased consumption, uh, tea, both in the Boston Tea Party and in the Opium Wars in China, uh, just drawing connections. Uh, it's important to instill uh, superiority right from early childhood. Here we see the Dutch, the British, and the Spanish trade routes uh, superimposed. Um, and the sun never sets on the British Empire. Uh, this company uh, system works so well that the British Empire grows to really cover the entire globe. And at the center, if, lest there be any doubt that this is the metropole, the position of power from which this control of this vast colonial empire, you see uh, in the uh, editorial pages of the Crown Colonist, a journal devoted to these global system of uh, colonial, British colonial servants. These are the locations of all the home offices of all these colonial uh, company operations elsewhere. Mm -hmm that then get transferred to uh, the government, the British government. And I hear the gong, but I think I'm going to do a double time transition from London to Calcutta. Mm. Any questions about the London episode? And so we move, we zoom down, we fall into Calcutta in West Bengal, now named Kolkata, um, to try to shed this impression of colonial uh, power. Um, the British East Indies Company establishes a uh, base there in 1690, uh, around the same time as St. Paul's is being constructed. And this insane colonial officer builds a palace and... Um, the architect is a military guy who just gets handed the task, and he says, what do I know about architecture? So he makes a copy of a mansion in Derbyshire, England. Uh, and it's this sprawling complex, uh, which is called Government House. But it's really the home of the governor general of the uh, East Indies Company. And, uh, and so you see, we've referred to this in the past because we spent some time recently in British India. Um, we referred to with the indo saracenic of Lechens New Delhi complex. Uh, we referred to the prior practice of uh, exemplifying the authority <clears throat> and the civilizing influences of the British. 
expressed and exemplified in the neoclassical. And so this is associated with the establishment of law and order on the chaos of India. And I'm trying to be consistent in the terms I use. Um, that this, out of the chaos of this Indian subcontinent of all these different ethnicities and different religions, uh, comes the ordering principles, the civilizing mission. Again, there's that term, a very important term in this history. The obligation of the British to go forth and civilize the masses. It's, we'll see a parallel in the Spaniards and the Portuguese, the obligation to convert the heathen to Christianity. Uh, here, it is stripped of the religious, um, the overt religious, but it is a religion of civilization and hygiene. Here's the Derbyshire original uh, with its four wings, uh, and here's the copy uh, in Calcutta. Um, the gates play a very important role. There are six gates with these lions. Each one is a triumphal arch that exists to the present. Um, and there is a, again, these went out of order. Let me see. Okay. We're missing some slides. Um, but one point is worth mentioning here, which is the formal spatial ordering of the veranda. It ties in with the theme. This is where things tie together. Uh, the space of the veranda for the colonial officer uh, is a space of power. The, the white colonial official is relaxing. He, dressed this way, bearing tea uh, and barefoot, is allowed up to the highest step of the veranda. Others the lamplighters, the, the tea maker, the person pulling, uh, running the, the fans and fanning the colonial officer, they are dressed in the way they are dressed, and they are not allowed on that top step. They might be able to come up to the second to the top, but each step has its associated clothing, uh, ethnicity, uh, requirements, and role in the household. And uh, so this is the veranda of the bungalow, the word bungalow, how many people grew up in a bungalow house? The United States is filled with neighborhoods of bungalows. It comes from Bengal. Uh, the colonial officials uh, fell in love. They adapted the indigenous arch uh, architecture, adapted it uh, for European colonial purposes, and filled entire neighborhoods. And the bungalow uh, became very popular and they reproduced it when they went back to London and of course the Anglophilic United States reproduces whatever they do in London and now Indian real estate interests are now uh, creating whole neighborhoods of bungalows with no recognition of them being based on indigenous local roots it's totally a copy of Arizona or California or whatever the bungalow in middle America um, so it's this ironic uh, cross-filtering. The operations of empire, again, it's a similar to the cultivation system. They produce tea, uh, but not as much as India. They produce cotton for the factories, feeding the factories of London. That's a classic metropole periphery relationship. Uh, indigo for the textile industry um, in London. And, of course, opium for the opium trade to China, which brings the bulk of the tea uh, to London, heroin. Um, and just like in the Dutch East Indies, you have widespread famine, especially in the 70s, the 1870s, uh, where uh, millions of people died. It's devastating. And um, the colonial officers sometimes help out the marginal population, but there is a huge die-off. Uh, which is tolerated by the colonial officials, but it's directly triggered by, it's a man-made catastrophe because of the quota system of uh, the extractive uh, operation of colonies. Horrible picture. Don't want to look at it. Any questions on that or anything? Max Havelar, H-A-V-E-L-A-A-R. There's a movie which I think is similarly bad. Have you seen it? I've seen it. Not sure. 
Yeah. Have you read it? Did they make yeah, you read it in school? Read it. Everyone reads it in school? It's a horrible book. Oh, yeah. yeah. Multatouli plan. It's this great brown cafe right there. It's the Multatouli plan. Other questions? Okay, thank you. Ah, Monday, special guest lecture from my partner in this course, uh, Patrick Hoy, graduate of this uh, program at MIT. We've been co teaching either directly since 2008 uh, or since his departure for SCAD in Georgia remotely. Um, and so he's going to be um, filling in this huge gaping blank hole in the course, which is the slave economy uh, at this moment in history. So Monday for Patrick Hoy. Thank you, everyone.